343. On the first, when pangs of death seize on my soul, unto the Lord I cried. Till Jesus came and made me whole, I would not be denied. I would not be denied. I would not be denied. Till Jesus came and made me whole, I would not be denied. As Jacob in the days of old, I wrestled with the Lord. And it's in death a courage bold, I stood upon his word. I would not be denied, I would not be denied. Till Jesus came and made me whole, I would not be denied. Old Satan said my Lord was gone and would not hear my prayer. But praise the Lord, the work is done, and Christ the Lord is here. I would not be denied, I would not be denied. Till Jesus came and made me whole, I would not be denied. Turn over to page number 303. Page 303. On the first, often I'm hindered on my way, burden so heavy I almost fall. Then I hear Jesus sweetly say, Heaven will surely be worth it all. Heaven will surely be worth it all. Worth all the sorrows that here befall After this life with all its strife Heaven will surely be worth it all Many the trials, stools, and tears Many a heartache may hear a Paul but the dear Lord so truly says, Heaven will surely be worth it all. Heaven will surely be worth it all. Worth all the sorrows that here befall. After this life with all its strife, Heaven will surely be worth it all. Toiling and pain I will endure Till I shall hear the death angel call Jesus has promised and I'm sure Heaven will serve worth it all Heaven will surely be worth it all Worth all the sorrows that here befall after this life with all its strife, heaven will surely be worth it all. Right. Amen. Isaac 43, 43. I was enjoying that. I'm glad heaven will be worth it all. Amen. And I'm glad it's a real place that he's prepared for us. And uh, I'm looking forward to going. And appreciate the Lord's grace on that regard. Amen. All right. A uh, handful of announcements here. Again, next Sunday, Lord willing, business meeting will be 4 o'clock p.m. before our Sunday evening service. And uh, want to resume our building fund offering. Um, so what we'll do is after Sunday morning service, uh, we'll, we'll take up that offering uh, after the service in the back like we had been doing and again, that's just to kind of try to go towards the building fund and all the things we've got going on uh, to try to supplement. Amen. Uh, one thing we want to do is we want, we're going to want to pay for all this as fast as we can. Amen. And so uh, that's kind of the idea behind that. And I wanted to give folk an opportunity maybe to give as God would have you. Okay. And that'll be next week. And we'll, we'll 
continue that second Sunday of every month um, in conjunction with the business meeting, okay? Um, bus ministry meeting. So this Tuesday, uh, we're going to have our regular bus ministry visitation. We've been doing that at 5.30 p.m., and that's where we just go, and we take a half sheet of paper, and it's got our promotion and everything. We give that to each rider and remind them and verify whether they're going to be coming on Wednesday, and then we'll come back. And when we get back here, we're going to have a meeting just to kind of rehash everything and touch base about our protocols, our rules, and uh, uh, just make sure we're, we're being good stewards with our bus ministry. Amen. And so uh, if you participate in the bus ministry in any capacity, come out. And, uh, you know, somebody was already asking me for service about uh, who's going to be going on visitation. I'm looking for a good number on visitation this week, mainly so we can get, get it completed a little quicker and get back here and then get into the meeting as quick as possible, okay? But uh, that's this Tuesday. Visitation begins at 530. Please come and participate, everybody that is involved in the bus ministry, okay? And uh, as I mentioned this morning, uh, we want to be good stewards also, and, and we want to do some growth visitation. And so uh, April the 9th and 16th, we're going to go and, uh, and invite folk out for our Resurrection Sunday service. Now, again, uh, be praying about that. I don't know what the sanctuary, the shape the sanctuary is going to be in, but I do know that we're going to celebrate Resurrection Sunday. Amen? And we're going to do whatever we have to. Uh, and there's some options there, but we want to do it however God would have us to. So pray about that. And, uh, and again, remember and participate in those visitations. Now, Brother Tyler so blessingly reminded me, turkey season's that opening up. I like turkey hunting, and I didn't even know that. And so I'm going to have to practice what I preach, amen? Ain't that what I dealt with this morning? <laughs> How that, uh, yeah, amen. Thank you, Tyler. You got you to sacrifice what you want for the labor. So uh, I'll be here, amen, on opening morning. Hopefully y'all will too. Which day is it? Don't tell me which day it is. I don't even want to know, amen? April 9th and the 16th, we're going to go and uh, do some visitation. And we'll eat together and have uh, some prayer before we go those mornings. But... Uh, I'm looking forward to that. That's exciting. Get to do something with our church family and go try to find somebody looking for him, and uh, that'll be good. That's how we found Brother Joe, wasn't it, Brother Joe? I hate to put you on the spot, but I remember we, we prayed before we left. We said, Lord, send us somewhere where they're looking for us. And Joe, I mean, I'll never forget, Brother Joe said, I've been trying to find a church. I've been asking the Lord to send some. I said, well, we asked the Lord to send us your way. Amen. And that's such a blessing. So... Uh, it still works. It still works, and we uh, we need to participate in that. So uh, April 9th and 16th, come help us. Come help us. All right, that's all the announcements that I have, um, I believe, at this time. So uh, let's, let's do this. I always like to get some prayer requests on Sunday night, especially for those that may not get to be here on Wednesday, but also to have some ready for even those that will be here Wednesday. But uh, let's do that. This morning we had a handful of, and I want to remind everybody about those. Brother Norman, you mentioned a meese. What's his name, David? And what's going on with him, brother? Okay. Okay. All right, thank you, Brother Norman. Somebody else with a prayer request? Miss Terry? Yes. Kind of give everybody an idea of what's going on there. Okay. She's on 
The biopsy is to determine whether it's cancer. She didn't say. They're doing a biopsy. Okay. Well, let's pray for Miss Eunice. And you're saying she's in quite a bit of pain too. So let's pray that the Lord help her with that. Um, pray that the biopsy come back as promising as it can. Amen. And pray the Lord help her with her pain. Somebody else. Sister Angela Parks has to Okay. Uh, Damien is sick tonight. So let's pray for the Parks family. Pray that the Lord help them. Somebody else? Mr. Yes. What was it? Prater. Okay, okay. Let's remember the Prater family passing a Mark Prater. Somebody else? Miss Debbie. All right, let's pray for Miss Elizabeth. Blood work come back tomorrow. Let's pray that it comes back okay and pray that she gets to feeling better. Amen, church. Somebody else, anything at all? Brother Joe. Uh, a co-worker of mine was dead, Terry Rogers. She was going to die from cancer. Uh, she had a cancer in the lung. Uh, and she has got heart issues that they got to take care of before they can they want to operate and remove it, but they got to take care of the heart before they can do that. Okay. Let's remember this. Terry Robertson, he's got cancer and dealing with heart issues. So let's pray for him. I asked the church to pray for my papa, Elbert. Um, he's got real bad shoulders, and he's looking at bilateral shoulder reverse total, reverse total shoulder replacements. Pretty big deal surgeries. So essentially what that means is, is once your rotator cuff is gone <laughs> and he's had both rotator cuffs repla uh, repaired in the past they go in and they do a shoulder replacement and they reverse it it's pretty much the only way they do it now so where your arm has a ball and your scapula your shoulder blade has a cup they switch them and they reroute your biceps muscle it's the craziest thing that what they do but that's how they do it now and they do that to fix the issue of not having a rotator cuff because the rotator cuff is muscles. Y'all didn't know you was getting PT education. Abby's over here dying laughing. Are you enjoying this? Am I doing okay, Abby? You did. It's crazy though, right? That they switched that. So, and the, the protocol for those things, just wait, just wait. Uh, when you're doing therapy on them, they can't do pendulum swings. Hey Amen. Y'all are enjoying this, right? <laughs> this is good. No, nobody is. All right. Anyways, so my papa is getting his done. They'll do the first one in April. Uh, pray for him. I'm rotator cuff repairs are horrid, pain wise. And if there's anybody in here that's had them, they hurt real bad. But now reverse total shoulder replacements are usually not too bad. Uh, but just pray. Pray that there's no issues. They told him a couple years ago he's got the heart of a 20-year-old man, which is unbelievable because he's not the healthiest guy in the world. But uh, you never know. So pray for him. Also remember Heather and Ada. Uh, Heather kept Ada home today. She had uh, been sick this past week. And uh, was pretty much better, but want to be safe there. Kept her home, her and size home. So remember uh, Ada today when we pray. And uh, remember Miss Janet, Brother Carrie's wife and Brother Carrie, uh, passing of her mother. And, and Jonathan, of course, let's continue to pray for the Thomas family, okay? Anybody else before we pray? Miss Terry? Yes, I forgot to mention that. 
Allie's headed to Florida. I called her a rascal when she told me that. I said, you rascal. So, uh, but that's for school. Praise the Lord. Let's remember her. She'll be heading to Florida. Anybody else? Miss Anna. Um, I have a question. Um, so, I can't tell you their names, but we had two girls at work. One of them's getting ready for brain surgery. And the other one, they found out that she has cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, so please pray for them. They're, one of them is up in age, but the other one is just 16. Uh, and then I mentioned Josh Burke this morning. Uh, he is home, but they've still got a lot of uphill climbing to do. Uh, so just remember the Burke family, please. All right, let's remember this. A couple of ladies, uh, Hannah knows with uh, going to have brain surgery and the other one's having some liver issues. And let's continue to pray for Josh Burke. He's home, but he has much to get done. So let's pray for them. Anybody else before we pray? Praise the Lord. Well, um, I heard a preacher say it like this the other day. He said, uh, he said, we're not just here to whine about our problems. We're here to give them to God. And uh, so let's be sure that as we pray, we believe in the one that's able to do something. Okay. Brother Beckham, if you don't care, play softly. Anybody that would like to gather in, let's go, Lord, in prayer together in one mind and one accord. And uh, I always desire you pray for me. So if you would, remember me as you pray. That the Lord would help me and watch over me tonight as I try to stand to preach. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you, Lord, for this church. Lord, thank you for the service this morning and, Lord, your hand on it, your presence on it. God, we thank you for, uh, Lord, the renovation. And, Lord, thank you for what they've been able to get done. And, Father, we just ask that you would continue to help them as they uh, work on behalf of our church and help our church, Lord, as we try our best to uh, follow you, follow your will, and trust you, Lord. You've surely been good. God, I pray you touch us tonight in this service. Help me as I stand to preach. Touch everything that's done. That it be blessed and honored and touched by you. And be with these requests. Be with David Meese. Lord, we pray that you'd help him. And uh, Lord, get him back out of the hospital, Lord. I pray you be with Miss Norfleet. Lord, I pray you touch the biopsy. Help her with her pain, God. I ask you give her victory over that. Lord, be with Miss Angela and their family. Touch Damien as they're dealing with sickness. Be with the Prater family with the passing of Mark. I pray, Lord, you be with uh, Miss Elizabeth, God. And well, we pray that the blood work would come back tomorrow good. Uh, but, Lord, we do ask that you'd give her some resolve for all these sickness and, and symptoms, Lord. Help Miss Elizabeth today, God. Be with uh, Terry Robertson, Lord, dealing with cancer and heart issues. Lord, we pray you touch him. Be with Miss Allie. She's traveling. Lord, give her mercy and protection as she'll be uh, down in Florida. And Lord, we pray you be with my papa. I'll touch his shoulders, Lord. I pray you touch the surgeries. Give those doctors a touch and protect him and help him. We'll be with uh, little Ada. Lord, thank you, Lord, for my family. I pray you touch Ada. Lord, we believe, God, that she's well. But Lord, I just pray that whatever lingers, that you would uh, resolve those things as well. Be with those two ladies. Uh, one dealing with brain surgery and the other with liver issues, God. And be with the Burke family. Be with Josh. He's home. We thank you for that. But Lord, we pray that you'd uh, touch and help and lead and guide in that regard and help him, Lord. Be with the, the Thomas family, Lord. Thank you for them. We pray you touch Miss Janet. Give her strength. Give her help in this time and continue to touch Brother Kerry and Brother Jonathan as they or mourn the loss of her mother. We pray you give them peace and comfort and joy in this time and uh, watch over them and again, bless them. Lord, thank you for my church. Thank you for my church family. Thank you for what you're doing around here, God. And uh, I pray, God, you'd help us not to ever get over the miraculous wonder of our God and help us to trust you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right, let's have the choir come sing these songs we worked on tonight. I think that'd be right. So won't y'all come, choir?
Sometimes I feel like a vessel, just useless old pieces of clay. But somehow you saw more, something worth dying for. You paid more than you should have paid. I know that you've seen all my failures. Yet your grace has always remained. And someday in that land before you I will stand. I'll lift my voice and praise your dear name. Knew I was lost and you knew that the cross was you that to pay. Christ crucified, Lord, you didn't have to die, but you did it anyway. Now I'll never see what you saw in me, cause you knew I would never be perfect. But I'm just so glad that somehow you thought I was worth it. So glad somehow you thought I was worth it.
would be so kind. He's bottled every tear you've shed, numbered every hair on your head. Hasn't he always proved he will take care of you?
Daily take up my cross with a crucified heart. Brother Caleb talked about that this morning. Paul said in the New Testament that I die daily. It's a decision we make every day to serve the Lord. And I'm glad for the days he gives me the strength to carry on when I don't feel like I can. Amen. I'm thankful for what he's done in my life. Would there be somebody with a word on your heart? Something you want to say or do at this time? Anything at all. All right, okay. Amen. Well, we're in Daniel. So grab your Bible, turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 7. I like that new song we sung. That Amen. second verse said, uh, Have you ever felt so unworthy of all the blessings, so undeserving? You'll understand why God would be so kind. And then it says, He's bottled every tear you've shed and numbered every hair on your head. Hasn't he always proved he'll take care of you? Boy, I like that right there. Amen. Yes. I'm, 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 that song speaks to me because uh, I've spent quite a bit of time throughout the years dwelling on how unworthy I am and dwelling on how undeserving I am. Uh, but in God's eyes, I, I'm, I'm worthy. Yeah. Man. <laughs> Amen. In God's eyes, in God's eyes, I'm. Let's say it like this: I'm worth it. That other song we sung was worth it. And uh, uh, folks, we were worth him coming and dying on the cross at Calvary so that we might not die lost and go to hell. And what a blessing it is. What a, what a miracle it is to be saved today. I appreciate them uh, young people, that choir. appreciate them singing. Amen. And uh, thankful for their obedience in that. Okay. Now, praise the Lord. We're back in Daniel chapter 7. And last uh, time we were together looking at this book, uh, again, what we've done is we have began our uh, journey into the prophecy of the book of Daniel. And this book is very prophetic. And this book is dealing with, uh, you know, the, the Gentile uh, leadership of the world, and right now where we're at in this prophetic passage, we're looking at Daniel and how that he, by God's understanding and by God's touch and vision, was able to see the big picture of all of time in these parables or in these uh, analogies, these typologies that we find here in this book of Daniel. Now last week when we, or week four last when we were together, we were in chapter 7, and we looked at verse 1 and 2. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to continue that, but we need to know where we are. Because if you're anything like me, you can't, there ain't no way you can remember what all you saw or learned two weeks ago. And it's important to kind of build on where, where we are and where we were last time, okay? So verse 1, in the year of Belshazzar, or Belshazzar, however you want to say it, right, Brother Beckham? Amen. Uh, Belshazzar, Belshazzar, uh, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his uh, head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Notice verse 2. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. Now, just a quick recap of what Daniel is talking about there in verse 2. The first thing you notice is you notice these four winds. These four winds. Now, I don't have time to go through the journey we took through the Scriptures to understand what those winds are and 
who those winds are, but by studying the Bible and showing Scripture and Scripture together, we saw last time how that this symbolizes four great angels, or a biblical term is princes. And that these four angels, or princes, or the book of Ephesians calls them principalities, uh, that they are under the control and leadership of the devil. And that he influences these four powers and uses them to shift the Gentile leadership of the world as he pleases. Now, I say that, but honestly, the fact of the matter is God knows what he's going to do. Amen. <laughs> if you was the devil, you know that would drive you insane. I mean, here he is, and he's trying to go against everything that God does. He's trying to combat the Lord. But God knows everything he's going to do. And here, in the book of Daniel, God reveals to Daniel how that Satan is going to influence the world by these four winds. Again, the Bible tells us that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. Amen. So it's just, it's, it's, it's so perfect how that God inspired men to put these words down and how that they go together even in their representation. And so we saw that, that breezy wind, those four winds, and then we saw the blue water. We looked at that great, the Bible called it the great sea. The great sea. And uh, the fact of the matter is many want to take this sea and, and, and try to interpret it as just the world. And that's fine in, in some application, but and because the sea is a type and picture of the world. Amen. I agree with that. But when you do a word search in the scriptures on the great sea, that's a specific body of water. And even though this is an analogy, if you will, this is a vision and God's showing these things by these pictures, that's a specific term. And last time we were together, I showed you guys, I put it on the projector screen, how the great sea was, Brother Zach says he's got it up there. Yes, here it is, it's the Mediterranean Sea. And we saw how that the four powers all are connected to that sea, all of them. Babylon, Greece, rather it's Babylon, then it's Persia and, and uh, Medo-Persia, if you will. And then it was Greece and then it was Rome. All of those world powers are connected to that sea. And what we'll find is that they come out of that sea according to this. And so there's just something about that part of the world. There's just something about it. You know, many want to believe it has something to do with the Garden of Eden and the beginning of time and how... It, regardless of all that, we know that that's what this is talking about. And we did that by comparing Scripture with Scripture in the book of Joshua, the book of Ezekiel. A bunch of references. I gave you that. And then uh, we saw how that there, verse 3, that there's four great beasts, and these beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from the other. And so that's where we finished last time, and that's where we're going to continue today, okay? So let's look at verse 3, or rather verse 4. The Bible says, notice, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings and beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh." After this I beheld, and lo, a, uh, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and or rather the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Hmm. We're going to read about this fourth beast in verse 7, but we're not going to make it to him today, but I want to go ahead and read it. It says, and this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the other beasts that were before it. 
and it had ten horns. Now, this is the four beasts. And these four beasts have specific characteristics that are listed. And this vision of these four beasts coincides specifically with the vision of the great image. Now y'all remember the vision of the great image, don't you? The head of gold, the arms of silver, the torso of brass, and the legs of iron. And those four, specifically four, sections coincide directly with the four beasts. And they are describing the same kingdom slash king. Some of them get so specific as to the type of king it's describing. Each section and each beast coincides directly to represent the Gentile world leader in their day. Does everybody understand what I'm saying tonight? Say amen if you understand. I, I want to make sure you do. Okay, because this is important going forward. These visions are depicting the world leaders. And they're specific. And let's just, before we get into it, let's just appreciate for a moment a supernatural book in this King James. Amen. 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 This is God's Word. It's so specific that there have been men that try to disqualify it by saying they had to know something. <laughs> That's amazing to me. They had to, they had to have written it later and backdated it. No, no. They're just amazed at the supernatural inspiration of a perfect Bible. That's what we have. I want to look tonight at these four beasts. We're going to look at the first three. Next week we're going to deal with that fourth one because it's pretty big. First beast that's mentioned, the lion kingdom as it calls it. The beast that was a lion. This beast is representative of the first, the head of that image. That head was an image made with the head of gold. Y'all remember that? The head of gold. And that head of gold represented none other than Babylon. Babylon is said to have had so much gold in and throughout the kingdom that they couldn't even measure the weight of the amount of gold within the kingdom of Babylon. And this first beast that's mentioned is none other than the beast of the lion. And it says it was like a lion, but notice that it specifically had eagle's wings. And so, by studying the scriptures, you know what I found out? Is I found out that Babylon, in a couple instances, was specifically mentioned as both a lion and an eagle. I want to give those to you, and I want to read them, because I like God's Word, and I want to read exactly what it says. In Jeremiah chapter 4, Bible's talking about Babylon in verse 7, and it says, The lion is come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way, and he has gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate, and thy city shall be laid waste without an inhabitation. This is nothing more than a prophecy prior to Babylon in regards to what Babylon would do to Israel. And you know what it called Babylon? It calls Babylon a lion. Also in the book of Isaiah, uh, <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 5, we also find another reference that specifically says Babylon is like a lion. There in Isaiah 5, 29, the Bible says, it says, Their roaring shall be like a lion, they shall roar like young lions, yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey, and shall carry it away safe, and none shall deliver it. This again is talking about Babylon, and it specifically references them like a lion. Okay, then we find mentioned that it was uh, this beast had eagle's wings. Well, in the book of Jeremiah, in chapter forty-eight, we read about how that this 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 kingdom of Babylon is likened unto an eagle. There in chapter 48 and verse 40, the Bible says, <clears throat> For thus saith the Lord, Behold, he shall fly as an eagle, and shall spread his wings over Moab. And then in the book of Ezekiel and chapter 17, uh, this really, this is good, this again is describing 
uh, uh, that's describing Babylon as an eagle. And this is what it says in verse 3. It says, and say, thus saith the Lord God, a great eagle with great wings, long-winged, full of feathers, which had divers colors, came unto Lebanon and took the highest branch of the cedar. And if you skip down to verse 7, it also references that eagle typology. And there was also another great eagle with great wings and many feathers. And behold, this vine did bend her roots toward him and shot forth her branches toward him that he might water it by the furrows of her plantation. And then in verse 12, it tells us, Say now to the rebellious house, Know you not what these things mean? Notice, tell them, Behold, the king of Babylon has come to Jerusalem, hath taken the king thereof and princes thereof and led them with him to Babylon. So, I'm reading you all these, I'm showing you all these references because I want you to understand that the vision that God gave Daniel coincided with how he was showing Ezekiel, how he was showing Jer Jeremiah and Isaiah what this nation Babylon would be because this nation Babylon is the specific nation that overthrew Jerusalem and Israel. We understand, right? Are we all on the same page? Say amen if you're with me. Amen. And so we see this first beast. We see that it's described as a lion. It's described as uh, having eagle's wings. And that just goes also into the ability that this nation had and when it came to war. All right? The lion is the king of the beasts. And many would say that the eagle would be the king of the birds of the air. So in other words, this nation being the head of that image, that golden head, the top dog, the alpha kingdom. Many want to look at the world today and say that the United States is the greatest power the world has ever seen. And it's just not true. Amen. Now, if the United States in the present situation we're in now was to go to war against Babylon in the situation it was when it existed, we would obviously win. Amen? Because we have artillery and they had swords. Enough said. But when you look at the competition that we have in our day, that they have in their day, listen to me. They were the top dog. They were represented by a lion in the beasts and an eagle in the birds. Why? Because they were going to win and defeat anybody. Do you understand? This is Babylon. But then the Bible begins to describe and tells us about how that, uh, uh, behold, it says the wings thereof were plucked. It says it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Well, church, this could be none other than Nebuchadnezzar. Chapter 4 Verse 33, the Bible tells us, it says, They shall drive thee from men. Thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. Seven times shall pass over thee until, uh, <clears throat> until thou uh, know the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth to, uh, it to himself or whomsoever, excuse me, he will. The Bible says the same hour the thing was fulfilled in Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from, the, from men. He did eat grass as oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven. Notice, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Nebuchadnezzar lived what Daniel saw in this vision. And what happened? Seven times passed over Nebuchadnezzar. The Lord woke him up out of his torment. He stood like a man. It's the Bible said he was given a heart. Nebuchadnezzar had a heart for God after he come out of it and, and, and submitted himself to God and recognized everything that took place upon me was because of God. This beast represents Nebuchadnezzar and the, the, the nation, the, the kingdom of Babylon. Beast number two. Beast number two is representative by bear, the Bible said. There in verse five. Behold, another beast, a second, like a bear. And it raised up itself on one side. It had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said unto, thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. This is a specific description that coincided directly with our history books, church. I can remember having world history in the seventh grade under, under our teacher, James Shively. 
Everybody called him Sonny. He was a black man. He was a great teacher. And Mr. Shively loved world history, and he was a fabulous teacher. Am I right, Brother Zach? He was good. You didn't have Mr. Sh you, you homeschooled the seventh grade. Brother Zach homeschooled one year. I'm a failure. Sorry, Brother Zach. Amen. Mr. Shively, great teacher. And I, re I can remember learning about these world powers in world history, seventh grade. And I can remember him talking about the nation, the kingdom of Greece, and the kingdom of Persia, Medo-Persia. I remember him talking about these kingdoms, and I can remember how that this coincides directly. Medo-Persia was the two kingdoms represented in the image by what? Two arms made of silver. Not as precious as gold, not as strong, if you will, but because it was two powers that came together, they together were able to defeat Babylon, that golden head, that lion, and that eagle. And so this bear comes along, and this bear has a different game plan. And we see how this bear, uh, 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 we see how this bear represents what they were because of how they uh, practiced their warfare. A bear is a giant animal. I ain't real afraid, honestly. I'm just not super afraid about being in the wild, but the idea of being where there are grizzly bears present. Black bears won't hardly bother you, but I'm talking about a brown bear where a sow, a female bear, will absolutely demolish your existence if she thinks you're threatening her calves. Bears are very scary to me. I mean especially them big old sows. And, and how they operate is by pure power. I listened to a, a podcast a while back and they were describing how that a grizzly bear by swinging its paw can knock an elk off of its feet. Now, I don't know how many of you guys have ever been in the presence of an elk, but we're not talking about a white-tailed deer. And I don't know how many of you guys could punch a white-tailed deer in its rear end and knock it off its feet. I mean, we're talking about sheer force and power. That's how a bear operates. A bear operates with size and with strength. That's how a bear works. And that's how the Medo-Persians operated. And that's how they worked. If you study this, this kingdom of Medo-Persia, you'll find out that it believed in the, that they believed in the idea of all or nothing war tactics. You say, what's that mean? Well, if you study war and you study some history, you'll find out that there was a lot of nations that operated by uh, breaking off into little armies all over the place and tried to uh, separate, spread out, and, and change the game that way. That's not how these guys worked. They would load up every single soldier they had. Their ideology was the more the better the bigger, the stronger. And they would literally go to war with as many as three quarters of a million men. 750,000 men all would come together, pick up sword and shield, and go to war against the nation. It's believed and said that Xerxes the Great, he was, a, he was that great uh, Persian king. See, this is another thing that it says about this bear. It says that it raised itself up, notice, on one side. Medo-Persia ultimately became Persia. The, 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 the other arm, if you will, became so weak that it just pretty much rose up on one side and didn't operate as two like it did in the beginning. And that's exactly how Medo-Persia functioned. And Xerxes became the king of this nation. And it said that he was almost, if not, eight feet tall. That's a giant. Amen. I know I'm big, but I ain't eight feet tall. Amen. When Xerxes was considered to be a god, they thought he was a god. And they worshipped that man. And he would lead that army with that same mentality, all or nothing. And it is said that when Xerxes led the army of Persia up against Greece, that they showed up with 2.5 million soldiers. That's hard for us to wrap our mind around. I don't know how many guys have ever been like, I like to use this analogy, Rupp Arena. 
and you go into Rupp Arena and it's full, it's like 24, 25,000 people. And you get in there and it's like, this is an unbelievable number of people. If you've never been in a crowd like that, it's something to behold. 2.5 million? That's like ants, y'all. Strength. Size. That's how a bear operates. That's how this nation operated, this kingdom. And it said also, uh, it, it talked about how that this bear had three ribs in its mouth. And that these ribs spoke, says there, that these ribs said, thus arise, devour much flesh. These ribs represent the three nations that Persia had to defeat in order to become the world power. Obviously Babylon, they also had a major war against Egypt and Lydia, and they defeated all three. And they, they encompassed all three. And what you'll read and what you'll find is that they joined in and just said, go ahead, we can't do anything with you. In other words, rise, eat much flesh, we can't stop you from doing whatever you want to do. That's what the Bible's describing here. This is the second beast. This is the bear. And it coincides directly with Persia. And then the third and final beast that we'll talk about tonight is the beast of the leopard. The leopard kingdom. But not only is this beast a leopard, but it's a leopard with wings. <laughs> a leopard with wings. And of course, this beast coincides with the third portion of that image, the torso of brass, the brazen army of Greece. Greece was led by Alexander the Great. And where the beast of the bear and the Persians fought with their size and their strength, that's not how Greece operated. Greece operated with their speed and their intelligence. They outsmarted their enemies. They set their enemies up and abused them with their intelligence. That's how they worked. And this is perfect because in my studies I have read and found that it is believed for the leopard to be the smartest, most intelligent big cat that exists in the world. If you study about these leopards and if you study about the area in which these leopards exist, you'll read about how all the other big cats stay gone. If you go into these areas and you try to kill a lion, you got to go into the wild. you got to go out there in the jungle. You're not going to just happen upon a lion walking through town, but a leopard will. The leopards are literally adapting over in these areas and dwelling among men. Now, the men don't like it and they try to kill everyone they can because they're dangerous. But that speaks of their intelligence, you see. They adapt. They're not going to let men come into their area and them just leave. You'll also find that they're stealth, <laughs> so stealth. I'll never forget, me and Miss Heather, we went on our uh, first big vacation after we were married. I graduated college, and we got in a vehicle and drove to New Orleans and uh, got on a cruise ship and on the Mississippi, Carnival, rode down the Mississippi, and we went to Belize, we went to Honduras, and we went to Cozumel, Mexico. It was a blast. We had a great time. And when we went to Belize, no, no, Honduras, we paid for an excursion. And the excursion was we were going to go to a private beach where we would eat uh, fried fish. It was wonderful, too. Ask Heather sometimes. She always talks about how good that fish was. And we would go snorkeling, and they had a private uh, animal rescue, they called it. <laughs> Well, it was awesome. The snorkeling was amazing. I'll never forget, we're going out, and literally we go out on this big pier, and there's a little old skinny man sitting there drinking, and he's about half drunk, and he says, jump in the water, follow the Coke bottles, one way out, one way in, good luck. I mean, that was it. And we got our snorkeling gear, and we're like, okay, so me and Heather, rednecks from Kentucky, <laughs> Or in Honduras, God help, ain't that amazing? And jump in the water, and yeah, they had Coke bottles tied to the bottom of the ocean floor like a trail. And so we're following them. I'll never forget swimming to the swim and look and looking down and following and seeing all these fish. And then we get to the end, it was like an underwater cliff. <laughs> and it's just dark blue. And I've never been so afraid in my life. I thought, I'm like a pop R. 
and there's a shark seeing me on top of the water coming off of the edge. And this is exactly how I fish for largemouth bass, and I'm about to get swallowed whole. That's, that's what I'm thinking to myself, bro. Like, this is terrible. And I turn around immediately, and I, I'm looking at Heather, and I'm going, I'm going back. Amen. And uh, we get back, and we lay down on the beach, and, and we went and looked at these animal rescues. Well, all it was was big cats in chain link fences. That was nerve wracking too. And so we're walking around and I remember they had a, a puma or a cougar and they had a tiger. And then we come to this one and it's a leopard. And I don't see it. I'm, lo- I'm like, Heather, where's it at? And she goes, it's right there. And I turn and look and it's laying against the fence, the chain link fence, and it's right here and I couldn't see it. Stealth. Well, you know me, I'm going to poke it with a stick, amen? And that's exactly what I did. I got a stick. I said, Heather, turn the camera on, record this. And we didn't have iPhones back then. <laughs> that's, this is old time, amen? And she had a digital camera. I remember she turns it on, and I stuck that stick through, and as soon as I poked that thing, it turned around and bit the stick in half. And I'm like, that was awesome. <laughs> and like, this creature, this leopard, is a bad dude. They're stealth. They're extremely fast. They're extremely intelligent. And that's how Greece was. Alexander was called the Great for a reason. Because he was a bad dude. Alexander the Great was able to seize more country than anyone else in the amount of time that he did it in. It took him 10 years. And he started when he was 22 And he was the world leader and the top dog of the world at age 32 years old, Alexander the Great. And he functioned and worked just like this leopard, but it was supernatural. So what do you mean? I'm not talking about supernatural in a good way. The Bible said this leopard had four wings. Isn't that what the Bible said in verse number 6? It said he had four ponies. Upon the back had four wings of a fowl, and the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. These wings, I believe, are representative of their ability to manipulate the air and for the air to give it strength. Four winds of the world, four principalities. Are y'all paying attention to me? Are y'all seeing the picture? The reason when you see these numbers, they're not just there for happenstance. They mean something. Four heads. Now, heads represent leadership. Amen? Amen? That's not hard. You don't really have to do any cross-referencing for that. Who's the head of the house? God put the, the man, the husband, as the head of the home. Christ, the head of the church. Simple understanding, but have four heads. So this leopard, even though this leopard is representative of Greece, and even though Alexander the Great led Greece as a singular leader, For that stretch of time, ultimately he was betrayed and killed. And when Alexander the Great was betrayed and killed, pay attention, this is not a coincidence. Let me make that statement emphatically. It is not a coincidence that Greece was then divided up into four governors. Four governors. I'm not even going to try to read these names because there's no way, but I can show them to you. Now listen to me, church. If Greece had been divided up into three governors, the prophecy would have been a lie. If it had been divided up into five, it would have been a lie. But four governors, specifically, this kingdom became the leaders, and this creature had four heads. And pay attention, the Bible says, dominion, look at it, Verse 6, was given to it. There was a supernatural assistance for this nation that was able to take over ten in 10 years more area, more real estate than any of those other nations. They weren't as strong as Babylon. Babylon was the lion and the eagle. They weren't as strong and as big 
as the Persians. That was a bear. But as a leopard, being very intelligent and being given the, the endorsement by the four winds under the four wings that this leopard had, its stealth and strength and speed gave it the ability to seize more and take over more quicker than any other nation prior to. How's all this possible? Because God knows what's going on, man. Now, Brother Shirley, does that mean that he's got everything predetermined and there's nothing we can do about it? Let me just tell you something today, all right? If you study your Bible, you're going to find out that free will is very present. In other words, when you make a choice, a decision, you're the one made the decision, not God. We're not going to be judged because of His works. We're going to be judged because of our works. Help me. You understand what I'm saying? Nevertheless, He is so sovereign that in the big picture, in the scheme of things, there ain't a thing nobody can do to change the things that He's already said will happen. He knows what Satan's going to try to do. He knows the end, the Bible says, from the beginning. And what we're looking at is we're looking at hundreds of years being described, being, being delivered, being spoken, being recorded on paper before anybody knew a thing about it. That's our God. Let me make that statement again. That's our God. And when we're looking at prophecy, may we never look at it like, oh, wow, whoop de doo May we never see these things and hear these things and think, oh, man, what's the big deal? The big deal is that, you know what you're going to find about Daniel when he reads these things? Look at verse, let me see. What you're going to find is you're going to find this messes with Daniel. And you're going to find that Daniel is tore up and distraught. Verse 15, Daniel was grieved, the Bible says. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body and the visions of my head, notice, troubled me. May we not fail God as we take a look at His Scriptures and undervalue the miraculous nature of what we're reading. Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, thank You. Thank You, Lord, for this message. Thank You, Lord, for these truths. Thank You, Lord, for the Scriptures, God. I know that uh, sometimes we can maybe become a little bored with this, but Lord, I pray that we wouldn't, and I pray, God, that we would appreciate what thus saith God's Word and how that You, Lord, revealed these things to Your man in Daniel. And Lord, I pray that You'd continue to bless these studies as we take a look at this prophetic book of our Bible. Lord, I pray that as we approach, Lord, the uh, coming Messiah, Lord, and as we approach, Lord, the, uh, the ancient of days and things of that nature, God, I ask that you would just bless and help and honor everything that's done, and Lord, use it for your glory. I love you. I thank you. I praise you. It's in Jesus' name I pray.